Good evening. Today is May 18th, 2022, and we're back in person with our State of the Harbor event, which is the signature event of CSCR. So CSCR is a, an acronym that's a little hard to remember, but it stands for the Center for Student Coastal Research. Um, we were founded 20 years ago, uh, apparently, so um, by Jack Buckley and Anne Tomei, and Mike Dick was involved, and Patty Thompson, I see you. Um, but 20 years, so big round of applause for Jack Buckley. For keeping <laughs> So we are a nonprofit that engages students in stewardship and learning about the real world through, through real world research. Um, and um, we're going to see how good I am at technology today. Swipe, swipe. Um, I'm usually a pencil and paper person. Um, so we have a Zoom being recorded. Welcome to all of our Zoom people. Um, it is being recorded, so please be aware of that. If you're on Zoom, please mute yourselves. No students need to be told this, right? It's only the, the older people that need to be told. And people who are on the Zoom, if you could type any questions or comments into the chat, that would be great. We'd, we hope to get a chance to read your questions aloud, but I think that's going to be smoother than trying to get you to um, connect to the audio system. Um, and if we don't get to anybody's question today, you can visit CSCR's website at www. CC, there's an extra C in there for Cohasset, so it's ccscr.org. Um, and I just want to thank, thank the town of Cohasset and Don Ryan of 143 TV and Wilcut Commons, the senior center here, for hosting us here tonight. It's pretty fun to be here and be back in um, face to face. Um, okay. When I asked Jack Buckley for some great points about what CSC's, CSCR's State of the Harbor is, he said that it symbolizes that, it really symbolizes that students are awesome. Students are awesome if they're just given the chance to use their skills and talents to investigate issues in their communities. So that's what this event really is all about. Our students are going to present their research. And we have people from town government here. We have people who are school administrators here. We have people that are super creative teachers here. We have our state rep, Joe Machino, here. We might have our state senator on the Zoom. So we have a lot of people who are interested in our data. Um, and we'd like to welcome all of you and thank you so much for coming because it really makes the whole thing authentic when our students are not just answering quiz questions, but they're actually telling people things about the environment around us here today. So within the past year, we've been introduced to a new term, and it's called MUI, if you speak African languages, or MIWI, if you speak NOAA languages, or what else do people call it? Thank you, guys. OK. Um, but it stands for Meaningful Watershed Educational Experiences. So this year, we got a grant from NOAA. That's the National Association of National Ocean. 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 Yeah, and Atmospheric Administration. Um, and we got a grant to do MUIs, or MIWIs, Meaningful Watershed Educational Experiences. We actually got that grant because that's what we've been doing all along, I would say. <clears throat> but the exciting thing about this grant is that it, and we've, we are taking our regular old CSCR, nothing old about them, our regular CSCR, <laughs> MIWIs, Meaningful Watershed Educational Experiences, and we're working with really creative teachers and really creative school administrators to bridge the gap between what happens in the field at CSCR in the summers that you will hear about from the students and what happens in the schools. So this is a new initiative and we're so excited to be working with some great partners. So we have both teachers and administrators. This is a big deal. From Cohasset, Hull, Hingham, Situate, Weymouth, and Archbishop Williams High Schools. We're working with uh, Neponset River Watershed Association um, so that the people in Weymouth schools have a close watershed to engage in. Working with Straits Pond because that's what the people from Hull came up with as their area of study. Hull's conservation agent is, holding, is helping with that as well as the Association of Straits Pond. 
And uh, we're all working with Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, which is another NOAA entity. Um, and we also have a great team of educated, education innovators from Open Way Learning, Next Generation Learning, and Lyft that we get to work up with on this grant. So that's pretty exciting. If I missed anybody. Um, now, do we have a person from Cohasset Schools? You do. Okay, do we have an assistant principal? Would you like to say a few words now, or do you want to do that? Okay, come on up. So, um, Ms. Noyes? Yes, I can Okay, come on up. Hello, everybody. I'm Tara Noyes. I'm the assistant principal at Cohasset High School. And we are thrilled to be here tonight um, on behalf of my staff and my students. Uh, we are very proud of the students that are here tonight before us, but look forward to even more exploring, um, tying our curriculum together, having the students collect the data over the summer that we can use within our curriculum, analyze that within our marine biology classes, as well as um, hopefully some of the chemistry. Um, very proud of Max and his crew for uh, just receiving that grant to study the eelgrasses and, and I think it's just going to bring more depth to our programs at Compassive High School. So thank you everybody that's here tonight. Mr. Buckley um, has joined our staff once again at the high school and we're so very happy for that. Uh, Mr. Savage, our science department chair, he also brings our program to another level of intensity and rigor for our students and really looking forward to seeing what's to come in, in the next few years with this project. And Grant, thanks so much. So you may think that we're all about science, but we're also, um, we do some civics, and some of that civics is what we're doing right here. So when you take your science out of your white paper and you actually present it to people and engage the public in what you're doing, that is civics. If you have more questions about civics, talk to Joan up there. Um, but there's a new civics requirement in the schools. So um, some of the things that we do here at CSCR will help the teachers and the students to take care of the, that new civics requirement. Um, the other thing that we feel we've covered here is when we get students involved in their world, we take a watershed approach. So. Everybody knows what a watershed is, right? Yes. Are you guys going to cover that? <laughs> yeah? Okay. If anybody does not know what a watershed is, go talk to the watershed group at the end of this. Um, but what we find is that watersheds, we find, as if it's a novel thing to find, watersheds do not respect necessarily municipal boundaries. So the watershed that flows into Cohasset Harbor and out towards Stellwagen Bank has properties in both Situate and Cohasset. And do you even have Norwell? Norwell. Oh, yeah. So, so when we study the ecology of these regions, it actually has us interacting with mini, mini, the different towns, three different towns right there. During the winter, um, if you see a, a, a slide of people with sleds and snow snowballs, you might wonder what they were doing. Well, we were sledding the shed, and we went up to the top of Turkey Hill, and we're trying to figure out which way the snow would melt and into which watershed it would flow. So our friends at the other end of the watershed are out at Stellwagen Bank. They're actually usually based in their offices in Situate, but Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary is that bank where the whales often go to pretty far offshore. Um, we want everyone to connect from stream to sanctuary as they study ecology, and we do offer a, uh, a certificate to students who have demonstrated um, a ability to understand that and present that. So if they can link their research to the Stellwagen Bank watershed and the rest of the watershed, we feel like they've done a good job and deserve a student to sanctuary certificate. All right. Um, do we have any CSCR alumni on that Zoom? I don't know if you can tell, Luke. Um, what, and or do we have any comments from CSR alumni that have come into the chat? No, okay, all right. Well, we do have great alumni. They're all just out there being too busy. Sometimes they come back and join us for our lecture series. We had um, some earlier this year, three of whom had received PhDs since their time here at, at, um, at CSCR. 
Uh, we're really grateful to a lot of community support here at CSDR. Um, very grateful to all of our sponsors uh, we have been, who are listed in the program. And we certainly couldn't do what we do without uh, sponsorship from them and also from a lot of wonderful individuals in town and the parents and the students and people volunteering. I'm going to have a big shout out to the Fernal family for taking care of so many it, details that needed to happen for tonight. And now I'm actually pretty close to on schedule comment. Can I? Yeah. So, um, obviously we have uh, we don't have our rehearsal uh, finely tuned here. We missed the dress rehearsal, but you want me to? Yeah. Water okay. Who's going first? Water All right. Awesome. Um, I did want just to emphasize that point about um, when Susan said that I made the comment about the uh, students being awesome. Every year we have a different group of students, obviously, and every year we have slightly different approaches to um, what we ended up studying and the information that we have to share. But each and every year, it really proves the point that when given the opportunity to engage in an authentic inquiry in the community, the students have an incredibly valuable role to play. And the point that I want to emphasize is that what we're also trying to do in our partnership with Situate and Hall and Hingham and Weymouth and Archie's and any other school that we bring in through this grant is to emphasize this opportunity to use the summertime when the students tend to have, even though the school year yeah. finishes, yeah. Summertime is a great opportunity to invest for the obvious uh, weather re related reasons for doing field work. But it's a great opportunity to engage in meaningful activities that are really important to the cities and towns, the stakeholder groups, whether it's a, a watershed association group or whether it's a, a particular board in a town. The students, when asked and when given the opportunity, can really deliver high quality information. And it really needs to be emphasized, which is what I wanted to do, because the students want the opportunity. And it's a great way to then elevate and intersect with and coordinate with the academic experiences that they have during the school year and it gives students an opportunity to also start carving out some directions. And obviously there's a whole bunch of accomplishments as well. Um, so instead of going on, I did want to just pound that point home about the effectiveness of students as resources in their community, highly under leveraged, incredibly underutilized, and it's something that we need to um, strengthen from this moment on, right? It's kind of given us the opportunity to get here with 20 years of experience. And, um, you know, it's like put the, put the pedal to, to the floor um, and accelerate a little bit more um, with these kinds of efforts. We got a great presentation, so you came here to listen to the students and the data that I was referencing, from, as Susan said, from the watershed out to the eelgrass. Um, from the upper reaches of the Gulf River into the urbanized area of North Situate, down through the mouth of the Gulf River, and into Cohasset Harbor, and out beyond the breakwater to uh, the eelgrass beds there. And then we, as a body of students, teachers, learners together, are going to connect that to Snell Wagner Bank. So, uh, Doc T students with the watershed, you guys are on. The group that we call the watershed is because it actually was the Gulf River, and we kind of expanded a little bit to get into the upper reaches of that uh, um, body of water, Gulf River. But take it away, gentlemen. Hi, everybody. So this is a presentation about the Gulf River watershed. So just to clarify, a watershed is a uh, pretty much a region of area where water kind of flows into and kind of where it gets taken out. And I guess kind of like where water flows into. For example, that's defined by the local geography and rivers. And so yeah, my name is Carl Bernal, this is our team. And so without any further ado, uh, <coughs> 
There are team measures of water quality at four different sites along the Elk River. And you can see here on this map, we have, have our four sites. Shockman's Lake, East Hunters Pond, and Spotkit. Uh, at the north is Shockman's, it's at the mouth of the Gulf River, and just north of it is uh, where the CSCR building is. <coughs> and so um, we measure pH, salinity, dissolved oxygen, nitrates, chlorophyll A, which is um, basically a pigment found in algae, and we can use it to uh, quantify how much algae is in the water. And uh, yeah, we do all of this stuff. At each field site, we used a uh, YSI, a handheld measuring tool, to measure temperature, salinity, and dissolved oxygen directly in the water at the location. We also took <coughs> samples to be later used in the lab for different tests. All right, so now what we talked about we did in the field, now let's go to what we did in the lab. So while we're at the field, we take two samples. We have to take a, we take a sterile sample and a non-sterile sample. So for the sterile sample, we use that to measure bacteria presence in water. We want to do that sterile because we don't want any bacteria from your hands or your breath coming in there. So we're trying to keep it as clean as possible. And then we also take a non-sterile sample to measure, for example, uh, optical brighteners, nitrates, pH, and chlorophyll A, because those, uh, I guess, the things we test for are less influenced by the uh, bacteria, and so they do not need to be sterile. Okay, so this is our uh, graph key. In all our graphs, uh, the blue bar will represent uh, the site of Shockman. Blakey will be red. Uh, the Scotia will be yellow or gold. And uh, 100 pond will be green. But that will show up most of the time, but sometimes not. And um, there's a black line on most of these graphs that represents the rainfall. And a red line, which uh, represents some cutoffs. So we measured. Uh, Salinity at every site, uh, except for Hunter's Pond, because it's a freshwater estuary. Uh, we found that rainfall had a significant effect on the salinity and inverse effect. As there was more rainfall, the salinity lowered. This can be seen at the start, or during July, there was an abnormal amount of rain. Uh, so the data in August is more representative of what can actually be found out in the Gulf River. All right, so pH, similar to uh, salinity, also had an inverse correlation with the amount of rain. So pH is the presence of hydrogen ions in the water, and what that means is that uh, certain like, animals and certain flora need a certain pH level in order to survive. And if you notice Hunter's Pond, that has a lower pH level because uh, Hunter's Pond is a freshwater site, and, and, it, and ocean tends to have a pH of around 8-ish, and salt water tends to have a, a fresh water has a lower pH. And so yeah, as you can see the rainfall, uh, it led to a decrease in the pH for most of the sites because rainfall tends to be acidic from, and that's where you hear the term acid rain come from. So when the uh, rainfall gets into, for example, the Chalkman site or the Blakey site down the river, it tends to decrease the pH. Uh, so bacteria is one of the important things that we do, and on this graph you'll see there's a red line, which represents around the cutoff for the state's swimming level. So if the bars are above the red line, it would be unsafe to swim in. And um, you can see here that some of the dates are not doing so well. And uh, we also observed a bunch of uh, foam flukes, which could indicate um, high bacteria concentrations. Dissolved oxygen this year did not vary much and was constant, which was good for each site. All right, so chlorophyll A is a pigment found in uh, various types of algae. And so it's pretty much what makes plants green. And so algae is a plant. And so we can tell by the concentration of the chlorophyll A. Now, more chlorophyll A means there's more algae in the water. And you can tell that by a uh, red bar over there is the cutoff, average cutoff value. So I think Noah says that the safe region is either is between two and four uh, micrograms per liter of chlorophyll A. And so, yeah, and that's where you have four. And if you notice, like, say, about over two thirds of the time, it was above that level, which would indicate a rather high algae presence, at least on the river where we tested. Uh, we also 
test for nitrates. Nitrates are um, basically food for algae. So nitrates and chlorophyll A are closely related. And in this graph, we can see here during the month of July due to the high amount of rain, the uh, amount of nitrates was diluted. But later on, there was also a small spike of rain which increased the uh, amount of nitrates, which is kind of a contradiction. But um, a little bit of rain makes the nitrates go up is basically the point. Optical brighteners are uh, found in laundry detergents, so it's uh, usually found in places where septic tanks are leaking into the water. Uh, we found that excess rain in July caused the optical brighteners count to increase because it washed it into the water. We also uh, found that compared to earlier data, the optical brightness count had reduced by 40%. <laughs> Alright, so that concludes the presentation. If you ever want to see a more, a more detailed explanation, feel free to see our uh, poster down in that side of the room. And also, we also have a uh, comparison to 2013 data, so we can explain to you the various trends from 2013 to 2022, and uh, you can see how the data has changed. So that's it for what you They really, they, their, their, their projects are much more elaborate than we've allowed them the time to present. So these are really just short teasers. Their project is particularly complicated because it has a lot of variables. But the idea here is they're going to, they're just giving you a short version, and then you'll go and talk to them at their booths uh, after the presentations. Exactly, <laughs> just what she said. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Susan. And so um, we're going to switch now to uh, the team that monitored bacteria with the Board of Health, Bridget and uh, Jack. Come on up here, please. So they did the, um, come on up, um, monitoring beaches with the Board of Health, and we did a little bit more of in-depth work in Colasso Harbor. Bridget DeGroote. And today we're going to be presenting some of our findings from the summer of 2021. Um, we measured bacteria levels, specifically enteric oxide, at Sandy Beach, Rocky Beach, and Cohasset Harbor. So. so basically what bacteria monitoring does, we research bacteria levels and other factors of water quality, like temperature and dissolved oxygen, etc at Cohasset Beaches and in the Cohasset Harbor, and then we deliver those samples to our own lab for analysis, as well as the Board of Health for a secondary analysis. Next slide. And so here we have um, like a brief summary of some of our results. So on top is our harbor bacteria averages, and the red line represents um, the rainfall for the week prior to that sampling event. And so as you can see, in the harbor specifically, there's a clear connection between bacteria levels and the rainfall that occurred in the week before. Um, the connection definitely still exists at the beaches as well, but it's most prominent in the harbor because the harbor obviously is more enclosed than a beach, and so it takes longer for it to filter out. Um, on the next slide, you have um, our sandy beach average, like our data result average, and then we compared it to the GNL Professional Lab, which is a Quincy-based lab that we use. Um, it's contracted by the town of Classic per state health requirements. And so you can see that all but our first sample was within the 95% confidence um, interval by using the IDEX method. And eight out of the 10 of the samples are within the 30% um, relative uh, difference, which is a common quality control standard. And in the upcoming year, we are going to continue our work and further explore the relationships demonstrated today. 
So obviously this was a pretty short presentation, but if you're interested in hearing more specifically what we found and what we're looking forward to continuing, um, please come discuss with us at the bacteria table for a week. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you, Jeff. And um, Ada Kogel is here to talk. Oh, here she is, right here. Beat me to the podium almost. Talk about the uh, monitoring of the Weir River. Hi, everyone. My name is Ada Kogel. I was monitoring bacteria and water quality in the Weir River for the DEP and CSCR uh, with my fellow student researcher, Grace Olandity. So we were monitoring primarily for enterococci, which is a bacteria primarily found in fecal matter. We were monitoring four sites, um, and we compared our data from summer of 2020 to summer of 2021, and we found that there were significant increases between the two years. This data is super important because if the bacteria levels are over a certain threshold, then the water is called impaired by the DEP, and it's not safe for swimming, drinking, fishing, or any other water-related activities where water could be ingested, because it can make you super sick. And um, if you want to see my data more specifically, or ask any questions, feel free to stop on and post it right over there. Thank you. Thanks, Ada. And now we're going to move on with Nick and Noah and um, a new team, a, a, a teammate new to me, uh, Nick and Noah, but Nick and Noah who have been uh, spending the uh, last couple of years doing some intense studies investigating vegetation at uh, Bassings Beach. My name is Layla, and this is Nick and Noah, and they have been working on this project for over two years. Um, and tonight we're going to introduce our project on estimating the percent coverage of dune grass, also known as Amapola bromoleculata, on Bassin's Beach Island. Um, so our research consists of three main steps. These are ground truthing, which is the in-field collection of data. Um, using drones to capture overhead images of the data and then developing and incorporating the machine learning aspect using Python and a convoluted neural network. And we conduct this research as the information such as the methodology and neural network will prove useful to other towns in conducting their own examinations of their systems. And the data that we collect on the beach is also important to implement into this neural network so that it will be able to accurately predict the overall coverage density of the app. And all this is important because the dewgrass is essential to bassing and it's holding sand together, diamond together, and protecting the system. Um, so thus far uh, today, We've taken 30 quadrat sites with our current methodology. We've also been working predominantly on the pre-processing coding behind the images. Uh, we've also conducted a few drone flights over top of the entire island, and specifically the vegetation of dune grass. But however, our ability to conduct these drone flights has been severely limited by the resolution on the drones we have accessible. And with that, if you have any further questions, feel free to visit us at our station over yonder, and yeah. Thanks, team. Um, before we do switch to our eel, move into eelgrass, um, by way of introduction to eelgrass, the dune grass vegetation is critically important to both the uh, towns, to both Cohasset and Situate, because that barrier beach protects um, eight, hundreds of acres of uh, salt marsh right behind it. It's an incredible part of uh, climate resilience for the town of Cohasset. 
and situate as well. And Ada's study in the Gulf, I mean, in uh, the Weir River is important to DEP. How far upstream does <coughs> pollution happen that finds its way into the Weir River and then out into um, Hull Bay? And, you know, when Susan was talking earlier about being in the winter time and having some fun sledding and thinking about where does all this water go? It's, you know, what, what I'm trying to do, perhaps ineffectively, is to just kind of put a little bit of context around here in terms of community resilience and climate change and all the work that needs to be done, which it goes back to my earlier point of the student work um, answering small pieces of the puzzle to these larger questions that we're all deeply concerned with. And obviously, we're deeply concerned with the uh, health of the eelgrass. Um, Owen is uh, unable to be with us, but Max is here. Uh, who got the shout out from uh, Ms. Noyce at the beginning of the uh, presentation. So Max, come on up, uh, wherever you are. There you go. And, uh, one more shout out for Max, who uh, and his team, on behalf of his team, submitted a grant to the Marshall Foundation which funds student hypo um, hypothesis-driven research proposed by high school students. And um, it's a $5,000 package in total for the work to, uh, uh, that will support their work. So it's something that Susan's been doing a lot um, over the last couple of years, uh, working with the old grass teams. And uh, Max has done a great job, and congrats on that. Take it away. All right, I'd like to thank everyone for being here tonight. And one of the most important things we do at TSER is outreach and spreading our message. So to start our dealer presentation, I'd like to show a short uh, few minutes of Owen Gert's film Zoster, which is produced over the summer. The full film is out now, you can find it uh, at Owen Gert on YouTube. Thank you. 
criminal on here, and you can engage in making individual points by which it corresponds to, in our case, eel grass, and every <coughs> moment we are over eel grass, by am seeing it here. Alright, uh, here is the 2018 to 2020 map presence of eelgrass. 
This is um, basically all the data that we collected over the last two years uh, with extraneous data or data where there is not, where it's, uh, where it shows a lack of eelgrass uh, that is not there, is only presence of eelgrass. And here's all the data collected in 2021. One project we took o uh, on over the summer was trying to track the shallow edge of the eelgrass, which was what you saw us swimming in the film. Uh, while trying to track the shallow edge, we kept one side of the eelgrass to us, and the other side was supposed to be where the shore is, meaning that we would track where the eelgrass ended and uh, the shore began. Uh, this is the data we got. As you can see, it is not very accurate. We believe that's because of both uh, human and technological errors, as the canway pavers you saw in the film don't work well underwater, meaning they give us these odd tracks. And it was also very difficult to consistently track the edges of the eelgrass tide, as it would be very easy to get lost in it. This is the second iteration um, on the uh, screen, where we used the, uh, we made it straight out, and basically we can see that we had more accurate results with the brown line and the fingers. I believe that uh, next year we will try this again and hopefully get more accurate results. One particular interest of CSER is our solo colonizing plants we have found. Represented um, here on the map are the pink dots. Solo colonizing plants are plants that have sprung out from the eelgrass beds into areas that have not yet been colonized from the eelgrass. They're less likely to be found through um, aerial imagery, meaning that it's very important to find them all ground through them. Uh, they can mean that the areas where a new colony will be um, founded or it is a place where eelgrass is not sustainable. So it's important for us to take notice so that we can map out eelgrass boundaries. Um, here are some changes we've noticed over the past couple years of doing CSCR. This map is made by Beck Labash, a former CSCR student and uh, now an alumni. He coded a map that would basically compare eelgrass presence for the past few years. The dark red areas mean there's been a lot of eelgrass density decrease. The lighter green areas mean there's been an increase in eelgrass density. And um, we welcome your continued interest and questions at CSCR. If you're interested in learning more about eelgrass, you can come to our booth in the back. And um, thank you for uh, being here tonight. Thanks so much. Um, as the students have said, um, they're eager to speak with you about their projects at these uh, tables. The you'll grasp, well, you'll find your way around the room. Um, it, it really is amazing. I think, and I think that this is a safe bet to say, the students and Susan are the greatest set of experts of eelgrass and the habitat outside of the harbor, uh, beyond the jetty. Doc T and her watershed team are the greatest set of experts in the area about the health of the Gulf River from the from Hunter's Pond. They're the experts. And my, my point is, we can call DEP, we can call um, uh, marine fisheries, we can call um, uh, the alphabet soup of regulatory agencies. The students of Doc T, Doc T are the ones who have the greatest expertise, firsthand experience and knowledge in the data set from, uh, as I was saying, from Hunter's Pond down to the mouth of the Gulf River. Jack and Bridget, um, have an intimate knowledge of how bacteria counts spike with rainfall and where, and uh, the flushing in and around the harbor. Ada, as well, and her team um, in understanding the connectivity that we have here in Cohasset with water bodies in other towns. We're all in this together, we're all in one watershed, we're all connected. And um, I find it amazing, which I guess I wanted to, because I have the podium, I wanted to make that point that they truly are uh, experts and they have a ton of information to share with you and uh, we really do encourage you to walk around the room. Um, and it, so I know Susan wants me to give a shout out to um, our town officials and uh, to Joan. I don't know if you wanted to say something very quickly, Joan. Sure. Uh, so, State Representative Joe Messina, for those who haven't met me, um, I, I, I love, I drove all the way here, I left early just to make sure I could get here tonight um, because I think the students' projects are so tremendous and it's just wonderful to see 
um, science and research for the, set, for the sake of science and research, um, but I also wanted to just say that as a state elected official, Senator O'Connor and I both rely heavily on the students and the research and just using Max's um, project as an example because it was last. Um, I just want to like point out that we just passed a new climate change legislation that included 15% of our carbon emissions will be done through nature-based solutions and, um, and carbon sequestration in particular. And so I just offer that to say that, um, yes, your students and your learning, but the, the, the projects that you are coming up with are actually incredibly relevant and of great interest to both myself and Senator O'Connor and we look to you and we wouldn't hesitate to come to you for five, even for a second. Um, we would look to you for research to inform some of the policies that we do on the state level um, as we think through. It's a deliberative process and it has to be timely and relevant and vetted and we need to know where our trusted resources are and we know that we can always go to CSER and the fabulous staff and students there um, to inform our thinking and even just to educate us on what issues we should be paying attention to. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you and um, thank you to Jack for just letting me address you for two seconds. And I, I am going to stay afterwards, so anybody who wants to talk about civic engagement, I'm happy to talk about that too. So thank you, everybody. Susan's given me a few things to do, and I, I might blow it, so I want to uh, just turn it over to Susan. She can make sure it happens. First of all, I would like to have to see um, people who are on a town committee or a town selectman, board of select, select board. Please stand up, just so we know who you are. And I'm just going to say while you're standing up, thank you for your service. It's great to have you. We also have, I don't think we've mentioned, Fran Collins is our professor of oceanography here. He's also on loan to us from Mass Maritime Academy in the world of shipping. <laughs> the oceanography students went out for the first year last summer, so they have not compiled their data yet on what they've found, but uh, look for that next state of the harbor or possibly some uh, uh, event between now and then. We do like to find events for students to present their, their research authentically. We've been asked to do so, and we will we do that when, when asked to. So that's really a great opportunity for students. But for now, we have an opportunity for you to ask students directly about their research, so that's what we'd like to get to. If you have questions about joining us for the summer, either as a student or as an adult who would like to help volunteer or mentor students or help run a workshop or a lecture, we would love to talk to you about that too. I'm Susan Bryant, that's Jack Buckley, we have Anne Tomei here, Ed Savage, and Fran, and Fran Collins all on our staff this summer, so please do stop us and ask how you can participate. Um, but for now, I would like to turn the floor to back to the world of mingling in person, which we're grateful to be able to do. So students, please go back to your booths. So all these presentations that you saw, uh, there's more information available. So please take this time to celebrate the students' work with them by perusing the booths and asking them more details about what they've done. They are at their best when they're asked real authentic questions by real people. So thank you very much, and enjoy your visits with them. Oh yeah, CSCR, it's just like a great opportunity to like bring us together with the people of the community and be able to share our findings um, with them because as Ada said, we oftentimes don't even like realize how much we know about a subject until we're presenting it. <laughs> well said. So. 